I wanted to say thank you to Evan, first off, for reading my blog, which is how I got here today. Um, I'm hoping somebody can set this up for me while I um, just introduce myself. And I, it's really cool for me to be here because I've actually never been uh, to give a presentation before in a place where people actually had to apply to come and watch me speak. And when I think about this, I cannot wait to go back home and tell my, my family this, that people applied to hear me speak because they won't believe it. So I, uh, I also want to just, uh, I want to mention my arm in a sling. Um, so that while I'm talking and you're thinking, you're not thinking about my arm and why the heck am I wearing a sling and isn't that great? It matches her outfit and all of that kind of stuff. What I, I you know, I just want to go ahead and tell you that as Ev Evan mentioned, I'm from Washington, D.C. and I broke my shoulder uh, when I was in a scrum for some free food with our Congress people up on Capitol Hill. But that's actually not really true because I would never get between a senator and his free shrimp. I broke it when I was bicycling. So, and, it, and I'm not at any pain, uh, so don't worry about me. I wanted to talk today about nostalgia. And thankfully, there are plenty of uh, people who are old enough in here to have nostalgia. So for you younger folks, you don't have to worry about this. This is probably not your issue. But um, nostalgia, I, I'm, I'm the last of the baby boom generation and nostalgia runs pretty rampant through my cohort. And you're always listening to, you know, wasn't it great when we were back in high school and, you know, things were great and I wore a size two and then college and that was really cool because we smoked a lot of weed and so, you know, there's a lot of that nostalgia that's going on. And uh, I'm not entirely sure that we're thinking about nostalgia properly. Uh, when nostalgia was coined in the 18th century, it meant a return home. But now we use it a lot to say a return to happier times. And while I'm not against uh, having good memories and thinking about the things that went on in the past as being very pleasurable, um, I think that, the, it's, that nostalgia is in fact being kind of misused for us to whine, at least in, in my generation, to whine a little bit too much about the past being better than the future. And I think specifically about this in terms of manufacturing, because I was on the front lines 20 years ago uh, looking at manufacturers, working with manufacturers, and, there, and, and I was lucky enough to be able to see trends in manufacturing and know that manufacturing was going to have a great future, but it was impossible. Uh, to talk to manufacturers, mostly small manufacturers, and get them to agree to that. Um, I got this quote out of the New York Times Magazine, Mike Huckabee. I thought um, it was a good quote. I didn't agree with it entirely because when he talks about constant value, what he's saying is he and his family would go to the same place every year at the same time and have the same food and sit in the same places and there was a constant value in that. And for me, constant value is not necessarily in repetition. So I think about that in terms of nostalgia and I think, you know, it, we shouldn't draw necessarily our happiness from the repetition of the past but more about uh, those pleasurable moments. This is my family in the 1960s. Uh, you can see me with my brothers. I showed this to a friend. She said, you were an angel? Yes, I was an angel. Um, and here we are uh, in our Easter gear. My, I just want to say my mother made this dress. I, was just, I just loved it so much. Um, but uh, this is us in the 60s. You can see that um, we were not really of the Woodstock generation. Uh, in fact, um, we were, we were obviously too young for Woodstock and my parents were too old, although at this time I realized my mother is 10 years younger than I am right now. So we weren't about Woodstock and you know Woodstock was a defining moment uh, for the baby boomers because you know that it was, it was really uh, iconic about that era and it was so iconic and so were well remembered and with such nostalgia that several years ago um, some of my baby boom uh, members went back to Woodstock, New York. They rented the, the farm. They got the bands uh, and they gave it their best effort. 
Uh, they, you know, they, they got naked, they smoked a little dope, they rolled in the mud, but it wasn't the same. So while they did recreate the event, it wasn't the same because it was about the event and it was not about the relationships and the spirit of the times. Now I get caught up in that kind of stuff as well because I remember when I was a teenager, I was dating this guy and every time we would fight, which is, I just want to say I'm Irish, so we fought a lot. But every time we would fight, I would um, go home and I would eat Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia ice cream, my favorite, which is still my favorite. And eventually he broke up with me, probably because I was too fat by, from eating all of that Ben and Jerry's. But it occurred to me that this kind of thing that I was doing was not working for me and that I was going to have to move on. I was going to have to do something differently. And um, frankly, I didn't really like that because I didn't know what different meant. I mean, I, I could imagine some things that I was supposed to do to, to do it differently, but it was opaque to me in terms of um, was that going to work for me? Was it going to bring me whatever pleasure I was getting from fighting and eating ice cream? Uh, you know, I didn't know. Um, it, was, it was a leap of faith for me to have to move on and to, and to try and do that. Uh, this is my, my father and my nephew in year 2000. Uh, Dad was 90 years old and uh, Joshua was three months old. He's now 13. Eh. Anyway, so he was three months old and I love this picture because there's like two or three lifetimes between these two, even though they're grandfather and grandson. Um, and uh, the thing about this is that my father, uh, he was born at the turn of the century, the turn of the, the, uh, the 20th century. Joshua was born in the turn of the 21st century. My father was born in New York at a time of like horse-drawn trolleys, uh, ice boxes for refrigerators, and Irish whiskey for warmth. And, and he, he told these really, really great stories, so much so that I could repeat them almost word for word. They were, he's, it sounded like he had a lot of fun. But you know, he was never nostalgic for the past. And that's why I, I think in part, you know, he's looking at Joshua so warmly because he was always, even though he had a great time when he was growing up, he was very much about the next thing, what was happening. And he really looked forward to the future. He had an optimism about that, that at the time I didn't really understand, although the older I get, the, the more I think I'm, I'm all about that. Um, so that was really very cool. I, I thought, you know, he lived through some really great stuff and he has seen everything from, um, you know, the, the horse-drawn trolleys to face transplants and the space shuttle. And he maneuvered through that, always very curious. And in fact, he died um, just a couple years ago at 101. And I think he put that extra year on because he just wasn't willing to go. He kept, wanted to keep seeing stuff. So what occurs to me is that the future from is, um, is opaque for many, many people, not just for me. And that we take pleasure in the past because we know what that pleasure is. We, it's a tangible feeling for us. So we can put a happiness value on it. But we don't know what the future is going to hold. So, and we can't put a happiness value on it because we don't know what that is yet. We haven't lived it. And uh, the journal Science came out with a, a, an article mm, a couple months ago that said people can't imagine that they'll like the future because they can't imagine themselves changing. So there's no way they can look to the future because they don't see themselves changing. And, I'll just say, my mother's in a retirement home right now, and she's surrounded by all these wonderful people who are her age, and um, none of them can believe they're 90 years old. They really, they don't believe it. They just can't. It, it, it's really very interesting uh, human nature. I've also been very lucky. I've, I've been able to travel around the world, and um, it's, it's interesting to hear what other people say about Americans. And, and these are some of the things that they say, and, and I would say not always is a compliment. But for me, this is a compliment because I think one of the things that this is that these list of attributes show how we put a value on ingenuity and that we are brash, we are risk-taking, but 
that leads itself into our desire for ever new and ever better. Because, and I think, so, so as Americans, we're, we're culturally attuned to, to new, to better, uh, to, to wanting to reinvent ourselves. And manufacturing, it, not just new manufacturing, not just next generation manufacturing, but manufacturing has always been about that. It has always been about taking ideas and making them real. So America is really kind of the quintessential place for manufacturing because we love to take our ideas and make them happen and to make them real. There we go. So what we're looking at right now, I think, is the democratization of manufacturing. And I'll explain that a little bit further, but as we go along and as manufacturing has been changing, one of the things that has both unnerved people and has also made manufacturing uh, so great now is that it's really not about the size of your footprint. It used to be if you were going to manufacture something, you had to have the land, you had to have the labor, you had to have the capital, all very big issues. And the bigger you were, you could manage to, to make those things happen. And then you could um, manufacture with economies of scale. But you don't need that now because a large footprint is not essential. What is essential now is that you have the cloud and that you use the cloud. Additionally, Western Europeans, uh, several hundred years ago, came to America, and I think this is why we have this sort of embedded in our, in our DNA. They came to America because they wanted to reinvent themselves. These were people who were risk-taking, who did not want to put up with the rules of primogeniture. They did not want to be uh, obedient to royalty. Uh, they wanted religious freedom, and so they came here from Western Europe to start essentially a brand new society. And that society has been um, admired by Western Europeans for a very long time, uh, even, even as they equivocate about wh who, they, who they think we are and what we're all about. But f to reinvent society is obviously no small potatoes. And so they came to make better lives for themselves. And I see next generation manufacturing the same as that. Because when you look at next generation manufacturing, you are talking about uh, the, a new model, which is distributed manufacturing, which means that you can have a person with an idea in this room, and you can have the person who creates the graphic for that idea in another state, and then the manufacturer in Canada, and the supplier in Florida, and the customers all over the world. So in this distributed world of manufacturing, you're creating equality of, of opportunity. And the other thing is that not only do we like new, but we like to make our lives better. And I think uh, advanced manufacturing, next generation manufacturing, is going to be the way to do that. So we'll have things like super fast computers that are the size of your wallet. We'll have nanostructures that are going to clean out your arteries mobile fabricators, which means that you can create a part uh, on a battleship or a battlefield if, if your machines break down, net, energy, uh, net zero energy appliances that will actually end up paying you for energy use, uh, nomad entrepreneurs who travel around the world uh, solving problems, and X-Men materials which self-heal when something is damaged. All of these things exist today. I mean, that's, that, that's phenomenal. Uh, so uh, in looking at uh, the news, and I was uh, watching 60 Minutes, but I was also um, reading a lot of articles, and it struck me that the pundits were all saying that classical ballet is going away, that um, classical music is going away, and that manufacturing is going away. And the truth of the matter is, is that none of these things are going away because we value, there is a constant value to what these things mean to us. The thing is that they're going to change. And this is a picture of the Big Bang. 
Now, it's not really a picture of the Big Bang because we weren't around then. But uh, somebody with an idea decided they wanted to see what the Big Bang looked like. And they took a machine that would uh, um, move particles around at the speed of light in a vacuum at minus 271 degrees Celsius. And I just think this is cool because in America, our ideas are as infinite as the universe. And if we can recreate the Big Bang so that we know what the very beginnings of life look like, certainly advanced manufacturing can change our lives as well. So thanks so much for being here, and um, I hope I get a chance to talk to you all of you later on.